The Alexander Archipelago and the Home I Found in Alaska by John Muir. To the lover of pure wildness, Alaska is one of the most wonderful countries in the world. No excursion that I know of may be made into any other American wilderness where so marvelous an abundance of noble, newborn scenery is so charmingly brought to view as on the trip through the Alexander Archipelago to Fort Wrangell and Sitka. Gazing from the deck of the steamer, one is borne smoothly over calm blue waters. Through the midst of countless forest-clad islands, the ordinary discomforts of a sea voyage are not felt, for nearly all the whole long way is, an, is on inland waters that are about as waveless as rivers and lakes. So numerous are the islands that they seem to have been sown broadcast, long tapering vistas between the largest of them open in every direction. Day after day, in the fine weather we enjoyed, we seem to float in true fairyland, each succeeding view seeming more and more beautiful, the one we chance to have before us the most surprisingly beautiful of all. Never before this had I been bossed in scenery so hopelessly beyond description. To sketch picturesque bits, definitely bounded is comparatively easy, a lake in the woods, a glacier meadow, or a cascade in its dale, or even a grand master view of mountains beheld from some commanding outlook after climbing from height to height above the forest. These may be attempted and more or less telling pictures made of them, but in these coast landscapes there is such indefinite, unleading expansiveness, such a multitude of features without apparent redundance, their lines graduating delicately into one another in endless succession, while the whole is so fine, so tender, so ethereal, that all pen work seems hopelessly unavailing. Tracing shining ways through fjords and sound, past forests and waterfalls, islands and mountains, and far azure headlands, it seems as if surely we must at length reach the very paradise of the poets, the abode of the blessed. Some idea of the wealth of this scenery may be gained from the fact that the coastline of Alaska is about 26,000 miles long, more than twice as long as all the rest of the United States. The islands of the Alexander Archipelago, with the straits, channels, canals, sounds, passages, and fjords, form an intricate web of land and water, embroidery 60 or 70 miles wide, fringing the lofty ice chain of coast mountains from Puget Sound to Cook Inlet. And with infinite variety, the general pattern is harmonious throughout its whole extent of nearly a thousand miles. Here you glide into a narrow channel hemmed in by mountain walls, forested down to the water's edge, where there is no distant view, and your attention is concentrated on the objects close about you. The crowded spires of the spruces and hemlocks rising higher and higher on the steep green slopes. Stripes of paler green, where winter avalanches have cleared away the trees, allowing grasses and willows to spring up. Zigzags of cascades appearing and disappearing among the bushes and trees, short steep glens with Brawling streams hidden beneath alder and dogwood, seen only where they emerge on the brown algae of the shore and retreating hollows, with lingering snowbanks marking the fountains of ancient glaciers. The steamer is often so near the shore that you may distinctly see the cones clustered on the tops of the trees and the ferns and bushes at their feet. But new scenes are brought to view with magical rapidity, rounding some bossy cape the eye is called away into far-reaching vistas, bounded on either hand by headlands in charming array, one dipping gracefully beyond another and growing fainter and more ethereal in the distance. The tranquil channel stretching river-like between may be stirred here and there by the silvery plashing of upspringing salmon or by flocks of white seagulls floating like water lilies among the sun spangles, while mellow tempered sunshine is streaming over all blending sky, land, and water in pale, misty blue. Then, while you are dreamily gazing into the depths of this leafy ocean lane, the little steamer, seeming hardly larger than a duck, turning into some passage, not visible until the moment of entering it, glides into a wide expanse, a sound filled with islands, sprinkled and clustered in forms and compositions, such as nature alone can invent. Some of them so small, the trees growing on them seem like single handfuls, culled from the neighboring woods and set in the water to keep them fresh 
while here and there at wide intervals you may notice bare rocks just above the water, mere dots punctuating grand outswelling sentences of islands. <clears throat> the variety we find, both as to the contours and the collocation -loca co of the islands, is due chiefly to differences in the structure and composition of the rocks. In the unequal glacial denudation, different portions of the coast were subjected to. This influence must have been especially heavy toward the end of the glacial period, when the main ice sheet began to break up into separate glaciers. Moreover, the mountains of the larger islands nourished local glaciers, some of them of considerable size, which sculptured their summits and sides, forming in some cases wide cirques with canyons or valleys leading down from them into the channels and sounds. These causes have produced much of the bewildering variety of which nature is so fond, but nonetheless will the studious observer see the underlying harmony, the general trend of the islands in the direction of the flow of the main ice mantle from the mountains of the coast range, more or less varied by subordinate foothill ranges and mountains. Furthermore, all the islands, great and small, as well as the headlands and promontories of the mainland, are seen to have a rounded, overrubbed appearance produced by the oversweeping ice flood during the period of greatest glacial abundance. The canals, channels, straits, passages, sounds, etc., are subordinate to the same glacial conditions in their form, trends, and extent as those which determine the forms, trends, and distribution of the land masses, their basins being the parts of the pre-glacial margin of the continent, eroded to varying depths below sea level, and into which, of course, the ocean waters flowed as the ice was melted out of them. Had the general glacial denudation been much less, these ocean ways over which we are sailing would have been valleys and canyons and lakes, and the islands, rounded hills and ridges, landscapes with undulating features like those found above sea level, wherever the rocks and glacial conditions are similar. In general, the island-bound channels are like rivers, not only in separate reaches, as seen from the deck of a vessel, but continuously so for hundreds of miles, in the case of the longest of them. The tide currents, the fresh driftwood, the inflowing streams, and the luxuriant foliage of the outleading trees on the shores make this resemble all the more com resemblance all the more complete. The largest islands look like part of the mainland and any part to be had of them from the ship, but far the greater number are small and appreciable as islands, scores of them being less than a mile long. These the eye easily takes in and revels in their beauty with ever fresh delight. In their relationships to each other, the individual members of a group have evidently been derived from the same general rock mass. Yet they seem broken or abridged in any yet they never seem broken or abridged in any way as to their contour lines, however abruptly they may dip their sides. Viewed one by one, they seem detached beauties, like extracts from a poem, while from the completeness of their lines and the way that their trees are arranged, each seems a finished stanza in itself. Contemplating the arrangement of the trees on these small islands, a distinct impression is produced of their having been sorted and harmonized as to size like a well-balanced bouquet. On some of the smaller tufted islets, a group of tapering spruces is planted in the middle, and two smaller groups that evidently correspond with each other are planted on the ends at about equal distances from the center gr central group, or the whole appears as one group with marked fringing trees that match each other spreading around the sides like flowers leaning outward against the rim of a vase. These harmonious tree relations are so constant that they evidently are the result of design, as much so as the arrangement of the feathers of birds or the scales of fish. Thus perfectly beautiful are these blessed evergreen islands, and their beauty is the beauty of youth. For though the freshness of their verdure must be ascribed to the bland moisture with which they are bathed from warm ocean currents, the very existence of the islands, their features, finish, pecu peculiar distribution, are all immediately referable to ice action during the great glacial winter, just now drawing to a close. We arrived at Rangel July 14th, and after a short stop of a few hours, went on to Sitka and returned on the 20th to Rangel, the most inhospitable place at first sight I had ever seen. The little steamer that had been my home on the wonderful trip through the archipelago after taking the mail departed on a return to Portland, and as I watched her gliding out of sight in the dismal blurring rain, I felt strangely lonesome. The friend that had accompanied me thus far now left for his home in San Francisco with two other interesting travelers, 
who had made the trip for health and scenery, while my fellow passengers, the missionaries, went direct to the Presbyterian home in the old fort. There is nothing like a tavern or lodging house in the village, nor could I find any place in the stumpy, rocky, boggy ground about it that looked dry enough to camp on until I could find a way into the wilderness to begin my studies. Every place within a mile or two of the town seemed strangely shelterless and inhospitable, for all the trees had long ago been felled for building timber and firewood. At the worst, I thought, I could build a bark hut on a hill back of the village, where something like a forest loomed dimly through the draggled clouds. I had already seen some of the high glacier-bearing mountains and distant views from the steamer, and was anxious to reach them. A few whites of the village with whom I entered into conversation warned me that the Indians were a bad lot not to be trusted, that the woods were well nigh impenetrable, and that I could go nowhere without a canoe. On the other hand, these natural difficulties made the grand wild country all the more attractive, and I determined to get into the heart of it somehow or other with a bag of hard tack, trusting to my usual good luck. My present difficulty was in finding a first base camp. My only hope was on the hill. When I was strolling past the old fort, I happened to meet one of the missionaries who kindly asked me where I was going to take up my quarters. I don't know, I replied. I have not been able to find quarters of any sort. The top of that little hill over there seems the only possible place. He then explained that every room in the mission house was full, and he thought I might obtain leave to spread my blanket in a carpenter shop belonging to the mission. Thanking him, I ran down to the sloppy wharf for my little bundle of baggage, laid it on the shop floor, and felt glad and snug among the dry, sweet-smelling shavings. The carpenter was at work on a new Presbyterian mission building, and when he came in, I explained that Dr. Jackson had suggested that I might be allowed to sleep on the floor, and after I assured him that I would not touch his tools or be in his way, he good-naturedly gave me the freedom of the shop, and also of a small, private side room where I could find a wash basin. I was here only one night, however, for Mr. Vanderbilt, a merchant who with his family occupied the best house in the fort, hearing that one of the late arrivals, whose business none seemed to know, was compelled to sleep in the carpenter shop, paid me a good Samaritan visit, and after a few explanatory words on my glacier and forest studies, with fine hospitality offered me a room and a place at his table. Here I found a real home, with freedom to go on all sorts of excursions as opportunity offered. Annie Vanderbilt, a little doctor of divinity two years old, ruled the household with love sermons and kept it warm. Mr. Vanderbilt introduced me to prospectors and traders and some of the most influential of the Indians. I visited the mission school and the home for Indian girls kept by Mrs. McFarland and made short excursions to the nearby forests and streams and studied the rate of growth of the different species of trees and their age, counting the annual rings on stumps and the large clearings made by the military when the fort was occupied, causing wondering speculation among the Ringel folk, as was reported by Mr. Vanderbilt. What can that fellow be up to? they inquired. He seems to spend most of his time among stumps and weeds. I saw him the other day on his knees, looking at a stump as if he was expecting to find gold in it. He seems to have no serious object whatsoever. One night, when a heavy rainstorm was blowing, I unwittingly caused a lot of wondering excitement among the whites as well as the superstitious Indians, being anxious to see how the Alaska trees behave in storms and hear the songs they sing. I stole quietly away through the gray, drenching blast to the hill back of the town without being observed. Night was falling when I set out, and it was pitch black when I re reached the top. The glad, rejoicing storm and glorious voice was singing through the woods, noble compensation for mere body discomfort. But I wanted a fire, a big one, to see as well as hear how the storm and trees were behaving. After long, patient groping, I found a little dry punk in a hollow trunk and carefully stored it beside my matchbox, and an inch or two of candle in an inside pocket that the rain had not yet reached. Then wiping some dead twigs and whittling them into thin shavings, stored them with a pump. I then made a little conical bark hut about a foot high, and carefully leaning over it, and sheltering it as much as possible from the driving rain, I wiped and stored a lot of dead twigs, lighted the candle, set it in the hut, carefully added pinches of punk and shavings, and at length got a little blaze, by the light of which I gradually added larger shavings. Then twigs all set on end, set on end astride the inner flame, making the little hut higher and wider, and soon I had a light enough to enable me to select the best dead branches and large sections of bark, which were set up on end, gradually increasing the height and corresponding light of the hut fire. A considerable area was thus well lighted, from which I gathered abundance of wood and kept adding to the fire until it had a strong, hot heart and sent up a pillar of flame thirty or forty feet high, illuminating a wide circle in spite of the rain. 
and casting a red glare into the flying clouds of all the... Of all the thousands of campfires I have elsewhere built, none was just like this one. Rejoicing in triumphant strength and beauty in the heart of the rain-laden gale, it was wonderful the illumined rain and clouds mingled together and the trees glowing against the jet background, the colors of the mossy lichen trunks with sparkling streams pouring down the furrows of the bark and the gray-bearded old patriarchs bowing low and chanting in passionate worship. My fire was in all its glory about midnight, and having made a bark shed to shelter me from the rain and partially dry my clothing, I had nothing to do but look and listen and join the trees in their hymns and prayers. Neither the great white heart of the fire nor the quivering enthusiastic flames shooting aloft like auroral lances could be seen from the village on account of the trees in front of it and its being back a little way off over the brow of the hill. But the light in the clouds made a great show, a portentous sign in the stormy heavens, unlike anything ever before seen or heard in Wrangell. Some wakeful Indians, happening to see it about midnight in great alarm, aroused the collector of customs and begged him to go to the missionaries and get them to pray away the frightful omen and inquired anxiously whether white men had ever seen anything like that sky fire, which instead of being quenched by the rain was burning brighter and brighter. The collector said he had heard of such strange fires, and this one he thought might perhaps be what the white men called a volcano, or an ignis fatus. When Mr. Young was called from his bed to pray, he too, confoundedly astonished, and at a loss for any sort of explanation, confessed that he had never seen anything like it in the sky or anywhere else in such cold, wet weather, but that it was probably some sort of spontaneous combustion that the white man calls St. Elmo's fire, or will of the wisp. These explanations, though not convincingly clear, perhaps served to veil their own astonishment and in some measure to diminish the superstitious fears of the natives, but from what I heard, the few whites who happened to see the strange light wandered about as wildly as the Indians. I have enjoyed thousands of campfires in all sorts of weather and places, warm-hearted, short-flamed, friendly little beauties glowing in the dark on open spots in high Sierra gardens, Daisies and lilies circled about them, gazing like enchanted children in large fires and silver fir forests, with spires of flame towering like the trees above them, and sending up multitudes of starry spark- sparks to enrich the sky, and still greater fires on the mountains in winter, changing camp climate to summer and making the frosty snow look like beds of white flowers, and oftentimes mingling their swarms of swift flying sparks with falling snow crystals when the clouds were in bloom. But this Rangel campfire, my first in Alaska, I shall always remember for its triumphant, storm-defying grandeur and the wondrous beauty of the song-singing lichen painted trees which it brought to light. Chapter 3, Wrangell Island at Alaska Summers. Rango Island is about 14 miles long, separated from the mainland by a narrow channel or fjord, and trending in the direction of the flow of the ancient ice sheet. Like all its neighbors, it is densely forested down to the water's edge with trees that never seem to have suffered from thirst or fire or the axe of the lumbermen in all their long century lives. Beneath soft shady clouds with abundance of rain, they flourish in wonderful strength and beauty to a good old age, while the many warm days, half cloudy, half clear, and the little groups of pure sun days enable them to ripen their cones and send myriads of seeds flying every autumn to ensure the permanence of the forest and feed the multitude of animals. The Rangel village was a rough place. No mining hamlet in the placer gulches of California, nor any backwoods village I ever saw approached it in picturesque devil-may-care abandoned. It was a lawless draggle of wooden huts and houses built in crooked lines wrangling around the boggy shore of the island for a mile or so in the general form of the letter S, without the slightest subordination to the points of the compass or to building laws of any kind. Stumps and logs like precious monuments adorned its two streets, 
Each stump and log on account of the moist climate, moss-grown and tufted with graves and bushes, but muddy on the sides below the limit of the bog line. The ground in general was an oozy, mossy bog on a foundation of jagged rocks full of concealed pit holes. These picturesque rock, bog, and stump obstructions, however, were not so very much in the way, for there were no wagons or carriages there. There was not a horse on the island. The domestic animals were represented by chickens, a lonely cow, a few sheep, hogs of a breed well calculated to deepen and complicate the mud of the streets. Most of the permanent residents of Rangel were engaged in trade. Some little trade was carried on in fish and furs, but most of the quickening business of the place was derived from the Cassiar gold mines, some 250 or 300 miles inland, by way of the Stikeen River and Dees Lake. Two stern-wheel steamers plied on the river between Rangel and Telegraph Creek at the head of navigation, 150 miles from Rangel, carrying freight and passengers and connecting with pack trains for the mines. These placer mines on tributaries of the Mackenzie River were discovered in the year 1874. About 1,800 miners and prospectors are said to have passed through Rangel that season of 1879, about half of them being Chinamen. Nearly a third of this whole number set out from here in the month of February, traveling on the Stikkeen River, which usually remains safely frozen until toward the end of April. The main body of the miners, however, went on up the steamers in May and June. On account of the severe winters, they were all compelled to leave the mines the end of September. Perhaps about two-thirds of them passed the winter in Portland, Victoria, the towns of the Puget Sound. The rest remained here in Wrangell, dozing away the long winter as best they could. Indians, mostly of the Stikine tribe, occupied the two ends of the town, the whites of whom there were about 40 or 50, the middle portion. But there was no determinate line of demarcation, the dwellings of the Indians being mostly as large and solidly built of the logs and planks as those of the whites, and some of them were adorned with tall totem poles. The fort was a quadrangular stockade with a dozen block and frame buildings located upon rising ground just back of the business part of the town. It was built by our government shortly after the purchase of Alaska and was abandoned in 1872, reoccupied by the military in 1875, and finally abandoned and sold to private parties in 1877. In the fort and about it, there were a few good, clean homes which shone all the more brightly in their somber surroundings. The ground occupied by the fort, by being carefully leveled and drained, was dry, though formerly a portion of the general swamp, showing how easily the whole town could have been improved. But in spite of disorder and squalor, shaded with trees, washed and wiped by rain and sea winds, it was triumphantly salubrious through all the seasons. And, through the and though the houses seemed to rest uneasily among the miry rocks and stumps, squirming at all angles, as if they had been tossed and twisted by earthquake shocks, and showing but little more relation to one another than may be observed among moraine boulders, Rangel was a tranquil place. I never heard a noisy brawl on the streets or a clap of thunder, and the waves seldom spoke much above a whisper along the beach. In summer the rain comes straight down, steamy and tepid. The clouds are usually united, filling the sky, not racing along in threatening ranks, suggesting energy of an overbearing destructive kind, but forming a bland, mild, lovely, laving bath. The cloudless days are calm, pearl gray and brooding in tone, inclining to rest and peace. The islands seem to drowse and float on the glassy waters, and in the woods scarce a leaf stirs. <clears throat> the very brightest of Ringel days are not what Californians would call bright. The tempered sunshine sifting through the moist atmosphere makes no dazzling glare, and the town, like the landscape, rests beneath a hazy, hushing Indian summerish spell. On the longest days, the sun rises about three o'clock, but it is daybreak at midnight. The cocks crowed when they woke without reference to the dawn, for it is never quite dark. There were only a few full-grown roosters in Ringel, half a dozen or so, to awaken the town and give it a civilized character. After sunrise, a few languid smoke columns might be seen, telling the first stir of the people. Soon an Indian or two might be noticed here and there at the doors of their barn-like cabins, and a merchant getting ready for trade, but scarcely a sound was heard, only a dull, muffled stir gradually deepening. There were only two white babies in the town, so far as I saw, and as for Indian babies, they woke and ate and made no crying sounds. And later you might hear the croaking of ravens, in the stroke of an axe on firewood. About eight or nine o'clock, the town was awake. Indians, mostly women and children, began to gather on the front platforms of the half-dozen stores, sitting carelessly on the blankets, and every other face hideously blackened, a naked circle around the eyes, and perhaps a spot on the cheekbone and the nose where the smut had been rubbed off. 
Some of the little children were also blackened and none were overclad. Their light and airy costume consisted of a calico shirt reaching only to the waist. Boys eight or ten years old sometimes had an additional garment, a pair of castaway miners' overalls wide enough and ragged enough for extravagant ventilation. The larger girls and young women were arrayed in showy calico and wore jaunty straw hats, gorgeously ribboned and glowed among the blackened and blanketed old crones like scarlet tanagers in a flock of blackbirds. The women seated on the steps and platform of the trader's shops could hardly be called loafers, for they had berries to sell, baskets full of huckleberries, large yellow salmon berries, bog raspberries that looked wondrous fresh and clean amid the surrounding squalor. After patiently waiting for purchasers until hungry, they ate what they could not sell and went away to gather more. Yonder you see a canoe gliding out from the shore, containing perhaps a man, a woman, and child, or two, all paddling together in natural, easy rhythm. They are going to catch a fish, no difficult matter, and when this is done, their day's work is done. Another party puts out to capture bits of driftwood, for it is easier to procure fuel in this way than to drag it down from the outskirts of the woods through rocks and bushes. As the day advances, a fleet of canoes may be seen along the shore, all fashioned alike, high and long beak-like prows and sterns, with lines as fine as those of the breast of a duck. What the Mustang is to the Mexican vaquero, the canoe is to these coast Indians. They skim along the shores of fish and hunt and trade, or merely to visit their neighbors, for they are sociable and have family pride remarkably well developed, meeting often to inquire after each other's health and attend potlatches and dances and gossip concerning coming marriages, births, deaths, etc. Others seem to sail for the pure pleasure of the thing, their canoes decorated with handfuls of the tall purple epilobium, Yonder goes a whole family, grandparents and all, making a direct course for some favorite stream and campground. They are going to gather berries as the baskets tell. Never before in all my travels north or south had I found so lavish an abundance of berries as here. The woods and meadows are full of them, both on the lowlands and the mountains. Huckleberries of many species, salmon berries, blackberries, raspberries, with service berries on dry open places, and cranberries in the bogs sufficient for every bird, beast, and human being in the territory, and thousands of tons to spare. The huckleberries are especially abundant. A species that grows well up on the mountains is the best and largest, a half inch and more in diameter and delicious in flavor. These grow on bushes three or four inches to a foot high. The berries of the commonest species are smaller and grow almost everywhere on the low grounds on bushes from six, three to six or seven feet high. This is a species on which the Indians depend most for food, gathering them in large quantities, beating them into a paste, pressing the paste into cakes about an inch thick, and drying them over a slow fire to enrich their winter stores. Salmon berries and service berries are preserved in the same way. A little excursion to one of the best huckleberry fields adjacent to Rain Gale, under the direction of the Collector of Customs, to which I was invited, I greatly enjoyed. There were nine Indians in the party, mostly women and children, going to gather huckleberries. As soon as we had arrived at the chosen campground on the banks of a trout, trout stream, all ran into the bushes and began eating berries before anything in the way of camp making was done, laughing and chattering in natural animal enjoyment. The collector went up the stream to examine a meadow at its head with reference to the quantity of hay it might yield for his cow fishing by the way. All the Indians except the two eldest boys who joined the collector remained among the berries. The fishermen had rather poor luck, owing, they said, to the sunny brightness of the day, a complaint seldom heard in this climate. They got good exercise, however, jumping from boulder to boulder in the brawling stream, running from slippery logs and through the bushes that fringed the bank, casting here and there into swirling pools at the foot of cascades, imitating the tempting little skips and whirls of flies so well known to fishing parsons, and perhaps still better known to Indian boys. At the lake basin, the collector, after he had surveyed his, surveyed his hay meadow, went around to the inlet of the lake with his brown pair of attendants to try their luck, while I botanized in the delightful flora which called to mind the cool sphagnum and carex bogs of Wisconsin and Canada. Here I found many of my old favorites, the heathworts, calmia, pyrola, cheogenes, huckleberry, cranberry, etc., on the margin of the meadow, Darling Linnea was in its glory, purple pinnacled grasses and full flower reached over my head, and some of the carices and ferns were almost as tall. Here too, on the edge of the woods, I found the wild apple tree, the first I had seen in Alaska. The Indians gather the fruit, small and sour as, as it is, to flavor their fat salmon. 
I never saw a richer bog and meadow growth anywhere. The principal forest trees are hemlock, spruce, nutcus, cypress, with a few pines on the margin of the meadow, some of them nearly a hundred feet high, draped with gray usnea, the bark also gray with scale lichens. We, we met all the berry pickers of the lake, excepting only a small girl and the campkeeper. In their bright colors, they made a lively picture among the quivering bushes, keeping up a low, pleasant chanting, as if the day and the place and the berries were according to their own hearts. The children carried small baskets, holding two or three in quarts. The women, two large ones, swung over their shoulders. In the afternoon, when the baskets were full, all started back to the campground where the canoe was left. We parted at the lake, I choosing to follow quietly the stream through the woods. It was, I was the first to arrive at camp. The rest of the party came in shortly after, singing and humming like heavy-laden bees. It was interesting to note how kindly they held out handfuls of the best berries to the little girl who welcomed them, welcomed them all in succession with smiles and merry words that I did not understand, but there was no mistaking the kindliness and serene good nature. While I was at Rangel, the chiefs and head men of the Sticking tribe got up a grand dinner and entertainment in honor of their distinguished visitors. Three doctors of divinity and their wives, fellow passengers on the steamer with me, whose object was to organize the Presbyterian Church. To both the dinner and dances I was invited was adopted by the Stikine tribe and given an Indian name, Ankutahan, said to mean adopted chief. I was inclined to regard this honor as being unlikely to have any practical value, but I was assured by Mr. Vanderbilt, Mr. Young, and others that it, it would be a great safeguard while I was on my travels among the different tribes of the archipelago, for travelers without an Indian name might be killed and robbed without the offender being called to account as long as the crime was kept secret from the whites. But being adopted by the Stickings, no one belonged to other tribes would dare attack me, knowing that the Stickings would hold them responsible. The dinner tables were tastefully decorated with flowers, and the food and general arrangements were in good taste, but there was no trace of uh, Indian dishes. It was mostly imported canned stuff served Boston fashion. After the dinner, we assembled in Chief Sheikh's large blockhouse, were entertained with lively examples of their dances and amusements, carried on with great spirit, making a very novel, novel barbarous durbar. The dances seemed to me wonderfully like those of the American Indians in general, a monotonous stamping accompanied by hand clapping, head jerking, explosive grunts, kept in time to grim drum beats. The chief dancer and leader scattered great quantities of downy feathers like a snowstorm as blessings on everyone, while all chanted, he ah he ah jumping up and down until all were bathed in perspiration. After the dancing, excellent imitations were given of the gait, gestures, and behavior of several animals under different circumstances, walking, hunting, capturing, and devouring their prey, etc. While all the quietly seated waited to see what next was going to happen, the door of the big house was suddenly thrown open, and in bounced a bear so true to life and form and gestures, we were all startled, though it was only a bear's skin, nicely fitted on a man. He was intimately acquainted with the animals and knew how to imitate them. The bear shuffled down into the middle of the floor and made the motion of jumping into a stream and catching a wooden salmon that was ready for him and carrying it on to the bank, throwing his head around to listen and see if anyone was coming, then tearing it to pieces, jerking his head from side to side, looking and listening in fear of hunter's rifles. Besides the bear dance, there were porpoise, deer dances, with one of the party imitating the animals by stuffed specimens with an Indian inside, and the movements were so accurately imitated that they seemed the real thing. These animals played were allowed by serious these animals these animal plays were followed by serious speeches interpreted by an Indian woman who said Dear brothers and sisters this is the way we used to dance we liked it long ago when we were blind but we always dance like this way but now we are not blind the good lord has taken pity upon us and sent his son Jesus Christ to tell us what to do we have danced today only to show you how blind we were to like to dance in this foolish way we will not dance any more thank you uh, another speech was interpreted as follows. <clears throat> Dear brothers and sisters, the chief says, this is the way we used to dance and play. We do not wish to do so anymore. We will give away all the dance dresses you have seen us wearing, though we value them very highly. He says he feels much honored to have so many uh, white brothers and sisters at our dinner and plays, and several short explanatory remarks were made all through the exercises by Chief Shakes, presiding with great dignity. The last of his speeches concluded thus. Dear brothers and sisters, we have been long, long in the dark. You have led us into strong, guiding light, and taught us the right way to live and the right way to die. I thank you for myself and all my people, and I give you my heart. 
At the close of the amusements, there was a potlatch when robes made of the skins of deer, wild sheep, marmots, and sables were distributed, and many of the fantastic headdresses that had been worn by shamans, one of these fell to my share. The floor of the house was strewn with fresh hemlock boughs, bunches of showy wild flowers adorned the walls, and the hearth was filled with huckleberry branches and epilobium. Altogether, it was a wonderful show. I have found southeastern Alaska a good, healthy country to live in. The climate of the islands and shores of the mainland is remarkably bland and temperate and free from extremes of either heat or cold throughout the year. It is rainy, however, so much so haymaking will hardly ever be extensively engaged in here. Whatever the future may show in the way of the development of mines, forests, and fisheries, this rainy weather, however, is of good quality, the best of the kind I ever experienced. Mild in temperature, mostly gentle in its fall, filling the fountains of the rivers and keeping the whole land fresh and fruitful, while anything more delightful than the shining weather in the midst of the rain, the great round Sundays of July and August, may hardly be found anywhere north or south. An Alaska summer day is a day without night. In the far north, at Point Barrow, the sun does not set for weeks. And even here in southeastern Alaska, it is only a few degrees below the horizon at its lowest point, and the topmost colors of the sunset blend with those of the sunrise, leaving no gap of darkness between. Midnight is only a low noon, the middle point of the gloaming. The thin clouds that are almost always present are then colored yellow and red, making a striking advertisement of the sun's progress beneath the horizon. The day opens slowly. The low arc of light steals around to the northeastward with a gradual increase of height and span and intensity of tone, and when at length the sun appears, it is without much of that stirring, impressive pomp, a flashing, awakening, triumphant energy, suggestive of the Bible imagery, a, bride a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing like a strong man to run a race. The red clouds with yellow edges dissolve in hazy dimness. The islands with grayish-white roofs of mist about them cast ill-defined shadows on the glistening water, and the whole down-bending firmament becomes pearl-gray. For three or four hours after sunrise, there is nothing especially impressive in the landscape. The sun, though seemingly unclouded, may almost be looked in the face, and the islands and mountains with their wealth of woods and snow and varied beauty of architecture seem comparatively sleepy and uncommunicative. As the, sun adv as the day advances toward the high noon, the sun flood streaming through the damp atmosphere lights the water levels of the sky to glowing silver. Brightly play the ripples about the bushy edges of the islands and on the plume-shaped streaks between them, ruffled by gentle passing wind currents. The warm air throbs and makes itself felt as a life-giving, energizing ocean, embracing all the landscape, quickening the imagination, bringing to mind the life and motion about us, the tides, the rivers, the flood of light streaming through the satiny sky. The marvelous abundance of fishes feeding in the lower ocean, the misty flocks of insects in the air, wild sheep and goats on a thousand grassy ridges, beaver and mink far back on many a rushing stream, Indians floating and basking along the shores, leaves and crystals drinking the sunbeams and glaciers on the mountains, making valleys and basins for new rivers and lakes and fertile beds of soil. Through the afternoon all the way down to the sunset, the day grows in beauty. The light seems to thicken and become yet more generously fruitful without losing its soft, mellow brightness. Everything seems to settle in a conscious repose. The winds breath gently, or are, the winds breathe gently, or are wholly at rest. The few clouds visible are downy and luminous and combed out fine on the edges. Gulls here and there, winnowing the air on easy wing, are brought into striking relief. And every stroke of the paddles of Indian hunters in their canoes is told by a quick, glancing flash. Bird choir, choirs in the grove are scarce heard as they sweeten the brooding stillness, and the sky, land, and water meet and blend in one inseparable scene of enchantment. Then comes the sunset with its purple and gold, not a narrow arch on the horizon, but oft times filling all the sky. The level cloud bars usually present are fired on the edges, and the spaces of clear sky between them are greenish yellow or pale amber, while the orderly flock of small overlapping clouds, often seen higher up, are mostly touched with crimson like the outleaning sprays of maple groves in the beginnings of an eastern, eastern Indian summer. Soft, mellow purple flushes the sky to the zenith and fills the air, fairly steeping and transfiguring the islands and making all the water look like wine. After the sun goes down, the glowing gold vanishes, but because it descends on a curve nearly in the same plane with the horizon, the glowing portion of the display lasts much longer, 
and in more southern latitudes, while the upper colors with gradually lessening intensity of tone sweep around to the north, gradually increase to the eastward, and unite with those of the morning. The most extravagantly colored of all the sunsets I have yet seen in Alaska was one I enjoyed on the voyage from Portland to Wrangell, when we were in the midst of one of the most thickly islanded parts of the Alexander Archipelago. The day had been showery, but late in the afternoon the clouds melted away from the west, all save a few that settled down in narrow level bars near the horizon. The evening was calm, and the sunset colors came on gradually, increasing in extent and richness of tone by slow degrees, as if requiring more time than usual to ripe. At a height of about thirty degrees there was a heavy cloud bank deeply reddened on its lower edge and the projecting parts of its face. Below this were three horizontal belts of purple edged with gold, while a vividly defined spreading fan of flame streamed upward across the purple bars and faded in a feather edge of dull red. But beautiful and impressive, as was this painting on the sky, the most novel and exciting effect was in the body of the atmosphere itself, which laden with moisture became one mass of color, a fine translucent purple haze in which the islands with softened outlines seemed to float, while a dense red ring lay around the base of each of them as a fitting border. The peaks, too, in the distance, and the snowfields and glaciers, and fleecy rolls of mist that lay in the hollows, were flushed with a deep, rosy, alpine glow of ineffable loveliness. Everything near and far, even the ship, was comprehended in the glorious picture and the general color effect. The mission divines we had aboard seemed then to be truly divine as they gazed transfigured in the celestial glory, so also seemed our bluff, storm-fighting old captain and his tarry sailors and all. About one-third of the summer days I spent in the Rangel region were cloudy with very little or no rain, one-third decidedly rainy and one-third clear, according to a record kept here of 147 days beginning May 17th of that year, there were 65 on which rain fell, 43 cloudy with no rain, and 39 clear. In June, rain fell on 18 days, in July, 8 days, in August, 15 days, in September, 20 days, but on some of these days there was only a few minutes rain, light showers scarce enough to count, while as a general thing the rain fell so gently and the temperature was so mild, very few of them could be called stormy or dismal. Even the bleakest, most bedraggled of them also usually had a flush of late or early color to cheer them or some white illumination about the noon hours. I never before saw so much rain fall with so little noise. None of the summer winds make roaring storms, and thunder is seldom heard. I heard none at all. This wet, misty weather seems perfectly healthful. There is no mildew in the houses as far as I've seen, or any tendency towards moldiness and nooks hidden from the sun. And neither among the people nor the plants do we find anything flabby or dropsical. In September, clear days were rare, more than three force of them were either decidedly cloudy or rainy, and the rains of this month were, with one wild exception, only moderately heavy, and the clouds between showers drooped and crawled in a ragged, unsettled way without betraying hints of violence such as one often sees in the gestures of mountain storm clouds. July was the brightest month of the year, with fourteen days of sunshine, six of them in uninterrupted, in uninterrupted succession, with a, de with a temperature at 7 a.m. of about 60 degrees, at 12 70 degrees, the 12 midnight, 70 degrees. The average 7 a.m. temperature for June was 54 degrees, with the average 7 a.m. temperatures for July was 55.3 degrees. At 12, the average temperature was 61.45 degrees. The average 7 a.m. temperature for August was 54.12 degrees. 12 midnight, 61.48 degrees. The average 7 a.m. temperature for September was 52.48. 14 degrees and 12 midnight, 56.12 degrees. <clears throat> the highest temperature observed here during the summer was 76 degrees. The most remarkable characteristic of this summer weather, even the brightest of it, is the velvet softness of the atmosphere. On the mountains of California throughout the greater part of the year, the presence of an atmosphere is hardly recognized, and the thin white bodiless light of the morning comes to the peaks and glaciers as a pure spiritual essence. The most impressive of all the terrestrial manifestations of God. The clearest of Alaskan air is always appreciably substantial, so much so that it would seem as if one might test its quality by rubbing it between the thumb and finger. I never before saw summer days so white and so full of subdued luster. The winter storms up to the end of December when I left Rangel were mostly rain at a temperature of 35 or 40 degrees, strong winds 
which sometimes roughly lashes the shores and carries scud far into the woods. The long nights are then gloomy enough, and the value of snug homes with crackling yellow cedar fires may be finely appreciated. Snow falls frequently, but never to any great depth or to lie long. It is said that only once since the settlement of Fort Wrangell has the ground been covered to a depth of four feet. The mercury seldom falls more than five or six degrees below the freezing point, unless the wind blows steadily from the mainland. Back from the coast, however, beyond the mountains, the winter months are very cold. On the Stickeen River at Glenora, less than a thousand feet above the level of the sea, a temp temperature of from 30 to 40 degrees below zero is not uncommon. Chapter 4 The Stickeen River The most interesting of this short excursions we made from Fort Wrangell was one up the Stickeen River to the head of steam navigation. From Mount St. Eli Elias, the coast range extends in a broad, lofty chain beyond the southern boundary of the territory, gashed by stupendous canyons, each of which carries a lively river, though most of them are comparatively short, as their highest sources lie in the icy solitudes of the range within forty or fifty miles of the coast. A few, however, of these foaming, roaring streams, the Alsek, Chilkat, Chilkut, Taku, Stikin, and perhaps others head beyond the range with some of the southwest branches of the Mackenzie and Yukon. The largest side branches of the main trunk canyons of all these mountain streams are still occupied by glaciers, which descend in showy ranks, their messy, bulging snouts lying back a little distance in the shadows of the walls, or pushing forward among the cottonwoods that line the banks of the rivers, or even stretching all the way across the main canyons, compelling the rivers to find a channel beneath them. The Stikine was perhaps the best known of the rivers that crossed the coast range because it was the best way to the Mackenzie River Cassiar gold mines. It is about 350 miles long and is navigable for small steamers 150 miles to Glenora, sometimes to Telegraph Creek, 15 miles farther. It first pursues a westerly course through grassy plains, darkened here and there with groves of spruce and pine. Then curving southward and receiving numerous tributaries from the north, it enters the coast range and sweeps across it through a magnificent canyon, 3,000 to 5,000 feet deep and more than 100 miles long. The majestic cliffs and mountains forming the canyon walls display endless variety of form and sculpture and are wonderfully adorned and enlivened with glaciers and waterfalls, while throughout almost its whole extent the floor is a flowery landscape garden like Yosemite. The most striking features are the glaciers hanging over the cliffs, descending the side canyons and pushing forward to the river, greatly enhancing the wild beauty of all the others. Gliding along the swift flowing river, the views change with bewildering rapidity. Wonderful, too, are the changes dependent on the seasons and the weather. In spring, when the snow is melting fast, you enjoy the countless rejoicing waterfalls, the gentle breathing of warm winds, the colors of the young leaves and flowers when the bees are busy, and wafts of fragrance are drifting hither and thither from miles of wild roses, clover, and honeysuckle. The swaths of birch and willow on the lower slopes following the melting of the winter avalanche snowbanks. The boss accumuli swelling in white and purple piles above the highest peaks, Grain ray gray rain clouds wreathing the outstanding brows and battlements of the walls, and the breaking forth of the sun after the rain, the shining of the leaves and streams and crystal architecture of the glaciers, the rising of fresh fragrance, the song of the happy birds, and the serene color grandeur of the morning and evening sky. In summer you find the groves and gardens in full dress, glaciers melting rapidly under sunshine and rain, waterfalls in all their glory, the river rejoicing in its strength, young birds trying their wings, bears enjoying salmon and berries, all the life of the canyon brimming full like the streams. In autumn comes rest, as if the year's work were done. The rich, hazy sunshine streaming over the cliffs calls forth the last of the gentians and the goldenrods. The groves and thickets and meadows bloom again as their leaves change to red and yellow petals. The rocks also and the glaciers seem to bloom like the plants in the mellow golden light, and so goes the song, change succeeding change in sublime harmony through all the wonderful seasons and weather. My first trip up the river was made in the spring with the missionary party soon after our arrival at Rangel. We left Rangel in the afternoon and anchored for the night above the, neck, above the river delta, and started up the river early next morning with the heights above the big Stikeen Glacier and the smooth domes and Copings and arches of solid snow along the tops of the canyon walls were glowing in the early beams. We arrived before noon at the old trading post called Bucks, 
in front of the Stikeen Glacier and remained long enough to allow the few passengers who wished a nearer view to cross the river to the terminal moraine. The sunbeams streaming through the ice pinnacles along its terminal wall produced a wonderful glory of color and the broad sparkling crystal prairie and the distant snowy fountains were wonderfully attractive and made me pray for opportunity to explore them. Of the many glaciers, a hundred or more that adorn the walls of the great Stikine River Canyon, this is the largest. It draws its sources from snowy mountains with, within 15 or 20 miles of the coast, pours through a comparatively narrow canyon about two miles in width in a magnificent cascade and expands in a broad fan five or six miles in width, separated from the Stikine River by its broad terminal moraine, fringed with spruces and willows. Around the beautifully drawn curve of the moraine, the Stikine River flows, having evidently been shoved by the glacier out of its direct course. On the opposite side of the canyon, another somewhat smaller glacier, which now terminates four or five miles from the river, was once united front to front with the greater glacier, though at first both were tributaries of the main Stikine Glacier, which once filled the whole Grand Canyon. After the, main trunk canyon, after the main trunk canyon was melted out, its side branches, drawing their sources from a height of three or four to five or six thousand feet, were cut off and of course became separate glaciers, occupying cirques and branch canyons along the tops and sides of the walls. The Indians have a tradition that the river used to run through a tunnel under the united fronts of the two large tributary glaciers mentioned above, which entered the main canyon from either side and that on one occasion an Indian anxious to get rid of his wife had her sit adrift in a canoe down through the ice tunnel, expecting that she would trouble him no more, but to his surprise she floated through under the ice in safety. All this evidence connected with the present appearance of these two glaciers indicates that they were united and formed a dam across the river after the smaller tributaries had been melted off and had receded to a greater or lesser height above the valley floor. The big Stikine Glacier is hardly out of sight, ere you come upon another that pours a majestic crystal flood through the evergreens, while almost every hollow and tributary canyon contains a smaller one, the size of course varying with the extent of the area drained. Some are like mere snow banks, others with the blue ice apparent, depend in massive bulging curves and swells and graduate into the river-like forms that maze through the lower forested regions and are so striking and beautiful that they are, they are admired even by the passing miners with gold dust in their eyes. Thirty-five miles above the Big Stick Keen Glacier is the Dirt Glacier, the second in size. Its outlet is a fine stream abounding in trout. On the opposite side of the river there is a group of five glaciers, one of them descending to within a hundred feet of the river. Near Glenora, on the northeastern flank of the main coast range, just below a narrow gorge called the Canyon, terraces first make their appearance, where great quantities of moraine material have been swept through the flood-choked gorge and, of course, outspread and deposited on the first open levels below. Here, too, occurs a marked change in climate and, consequently, in forest and general appearance of the face of the country. On account of destructive fires, the woods are young and are composed of smaller trees about a foot to 18 inches in diameter and 75 feet high, mostly two-leaved pines, which hold their seeds for several years after they are ripe. The woods here are without a trace of those deep accumulations of mosses and leaves and decaying trunks which make so damp and unclearable a mass in the coast forest. Whole mountainsides are covered with gray moss and lichens where the forest has been utterly destroyed. The riverbank cottonwoods are also smaller, and a birch and, and contorta pines mingle freely with the coast hemlock and spruce. The birch is common on the lower slopes and is very effective, its round, leafy, pale green head contrasting with the dark narrow spires of the conifers and giving a striking character to the forest. The tamarack pine, or black pine, as the variety of P. contorta is called here, is yellowish green, in marked contrast with the dark lichen draped spruce which grows above the pine at a height of about 2,000 feet, in groves and belts where it has escaped fire and snow avalanches. There is another handsome spruce hereabouts. Picea alba, very slender and graceful in habit, drooping at the top like a mountain hemlock. I saw fine specimens 125 feet high on deep bottom land a few miles below Glenora. The tops of some of them were almost covered with dense clusters of yellow and brown cones. We reached the old Hudson's Bay trading post at Glenora about one o'clock, and the captain informed me that he would stop here until the next morning when he would make an early start for Wrangell. At a distance of about seven or eight miles to the northeastward of the landing, 
There is an outstanding group of mountains crowning a spur from the main chain of the coast range, whose highest point rises about 8,000 feet above the level of the sea. And as Glenora is only 1,000 feet above the sea, the height to be overcome in climbing this peak is about 7,000 feet. Though the time was short, I determined to climb it, because of the advantageous position it occupies for, for general views of the peaks and glaciers of the east side of the Great Range. Although it was now twenty minutes past three and the days were getting short, I thought that by rapid climbing I could reach the summit before sunset in time to get a general view and a few pencil sketches and make my way back to the steamer in the night. Mr. Young, one of the missionaries, asked permission to accompany me, saying that he was a good walker and climber and would not delay me or cause any trouble. I strongly advised him not to go, explaining that it involved a walk, coming and going, of fourteen or sixteen miles, and a climb through brush and boulders of seven thousand feet, a fair day's work for a seasoned mountaineer to be done in less than half a day and part of a night. But he insisted that he was a strong walker, could do a mountaineer's day's work in half a day, and would not hinder me in any way. Well, I have warned you, I said, and will not assume responsibility for any trouble that may arise. He proved to be a stout walker, and we made rapid progress across a brushy timbered flat and up the mountain slopes, open in some places and in others thatched with dwarf firs, resting a minute here and there to refresh ourselves with huckleberries which grew in abundance in open spots. About half an hour before sunset, when we were near a cluster of crumbling pinnacles that formed the summit, I had ceased to feel anxiety about the mountaineering strength and skill of my companion and pushed rapidly on. And passing around the shoulder of the highest pinnacle, where the rock was rapidly disintegrating and the danger of slipping was great, I shouted in a warning voice, Be very careful here, this is very dangerous. <clears throat> Mr. Young was perhaps a dozen or two yards behind me, but out of sight. I afterwards reproached myself for not stopping and lending him a steadying hand and showing him the slight footsteps I had made by kicking out little blocks of the crumbling surface. Instead of simply warning him to be careful, only a few seconds after giving this warning, I was startled by a scream for help and hurrying back found the missionary face down, his arms outstretched, clutching little crumbling knobs on the brink of a gully that plunges down a thousand feet or more to a small residual glacier. I managed to get below him, touched one of his feet, and tried to encourage him by, staying, by saying, I am below you, you are in no danger, you can't slip past me and I will soon get you out of this. He then told me that both of his arms are dislocated, it was almost impossible to find available footholds on the treasure stock, and I was at my wit's end to know how to get him rolled or dragged to a place where I could get about him, find out how much he was hurt, and then way back down the mountain. After narrowly scanning the cliffs and making footholds, I managed to roll and lift him a few yards to a place where the slope was less steep, and there I attempted to set his arms. I found, however, that this was impossible in such a place. I therefore tied his arms to his sides with my suspenders and necktie to prevent as much as possible inflammation from movement. I then left him, telling him to lie still, that I would be back in a few minutes, and that he was now safe from slipping. I hastily examined the ground and saw no way of getting him down except by the steep glacier gully. After scrambling to an outstanding point that commands a view of it from top to bottom to make sure that it was not interrupted by sheer precipices, I concluded that with great care and digging of slight footholds, he could be slid down to the glacier where I could lay him on his back and perhaps be able to set his arms. Accordingly, I cheered him up telling him I had found a way and that it would require lots of time and patience. Digging a footstep in the sand or crumbling rock five or six feet beneath him, I reached up, took hold of him by one of his feet, and gently slid him down on his back, placed his heels in the steep, in the step, then descended another five or six feet, dug heel notches, and slid him down to them. Thus the whole distance was made by a succession of narrow steps at very short intervals, and the glacier was reached perhaps about midnight. Here I took off one of my boots, tied a handkerchief around his wrist for a good hold, placed my heel in his armpit, and succeeded in getting one of his arms in place. But my utmost strength was insufficient to reduce the dislocation of the other, and I therefore bound it closely to his side. I asked him if in his exhausted and trouble, trembling condition he was still able to walk. Yes, he bravely replied. So with a steady arm around him and many stops for rest, I marched him slowly down in the starlight on the comparatively smooth, unassured surface of the little glacier to the terminal moraine, a distance of perhaps a mile across the moraine, bathed his head at one of the outlet streams, and after many rests, reached a dry place and made a brush fire. I then went ahead, looked for an open way through the brush where larger wood could be had, made a good lasting fire of resiny silver fir roots and leafy bed beside it, and now I told him I would run down the mountain, hasten back to help with the help from the boat, and carry him down in comfort but he would not hear of my leaving him. 
No, no, he said. I can walk down. Don't leave me. I reminded him of the roughness of the way, his nerve-shaking condition, and assured him I would not be gone long. But he insisted on trying, saying on no account whatever must I leave him. I therefore, I therefore concluded to try to get him to the ship by short walks from one fire and resting place to another. While he was resting, I went ahead, looking for the best way through the brush and rocks, and then returning, got him on his feet and made him lean on my shoulders while I steadied him to prevent his falling. This slow, staggering struggle from fire to fire lasted until long after sunrise, when at last we reached the ship and stood at the foot of the narrow single plank without side rails that reached from the bank to the deck at a considerable angle. I believe he explained to Mr. Young's companions, who stood looking down at us, that he had been hurt in an accident and requested one of them to assist me in getting him aboard, but strange to say, instead of coming down to help, they made, him, they made haste to reproach him for having gone on a wild goose chase with Muir. These foolish adventures are well enough for Mr. Muir, they said, but you, Mr. Young, have a work to do. You have a family, you have a church, and you have no right to risk your life on treacherous peaks and precipices. The captain, Nat Lane, son of Senator Joseph Lane, had been swearing in angry impatience for being compelled to make so late a start, and thus encountered a dangerous wind in a narrow gorge, and was threatening to put the missionaries ashore to seek their lost companion. While he went on down the river about his business, but... When he heard my call for help, he hastened forward and elbowed the divines away from the end of the gangplank, shouting in angry ir irreverence, Oh, Blake, this is no time for preaching. Don't you see the man is hurt? He ran down to our help, and while I, studied, while I steadied my trembling companion from behind, the captain kindly led him up the plank into the saloon and made him drink a large glass of brandy. Then, with the man holding down his shoulders, we succeeded in getting the bone into its socket, notwithstanding the inflammation and contraction of the muscles and ligaments. Mr. Young was then put to bed, and he slept all the way back to Rangel. In his mission lectures in the East, Mr. Young oftentimes told this story. I made no record of it in my notebook and never intended to write a word about it, but after a miserable and sensational caricature of the story had appeared in a respectable magazine, I thought it but fair to my brave companion that it should be told just as it happened. Well, we've done the hard part couple miles across the bay and the complete absurdity of swimming upstream like the gosh dang salmon that pretty much feed every animal in this forest in some way or another it's actually a bit of a peat bog the sun's shining down on right now as a sprinkling I've actually had snow when the sun was out. That was interesting. The bears are supposed to be coming out of hibernation. I learned that this type of a geographical feature is called a Doris. The Doris, the, the fertile places where fresh water rivers run into the ocean, where all civilizations have started. Fast! I'm drifting! Okay, come on. And then I remember the words of uh, the man, at, the kind man I borrowed this uh, kayak from, lovely Mormon family, uh, living completely honest lives on the island. God, those boys have fun living out here. Yeah, but I remember him showing me a tide chart. Said, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, if you're going to be over here till such and such a time, this is when the tide changes and the river can turn into rapids in sections. And so uh, we may be in for a bit of an adventure. The woman I'm staying with, she told me about the Doris. She had named her lovely Cocker Spaniel Doris. That's been keeping me company in absence of Miss Gruffles. Interesting, uh, when I go into these wild places, I often come face to face with people that I'd be facing down with weapons of war back in the 48. She is a big Trump supporter, and we only argued about it once, maybe once and a half. These beautiful places, though. Where nature is so overwhelming, ideology takes a back seat. This is where we find the better version of ourselves. Unfortunately, some of those folks don't mind taking the uh, check yearly 
check from the state of Alaska since they have socialized um, their uh, oil and their timber so that every resident gets a piece that keeps people from voting for conservationist policies and that fulfills the sayings of the good Lord himself that you cannot serve both God and mammon. This is a, this is a, this is a little Doris right here. Hey, little Doris. Thank God. See, nature intervened. I was about to start preaching again. We might see some black tailed deer, some bald eagle. I've, I've seen those so far. We might see some river otters. I'd love to see a bear. Any day now, fellas. Come on out of hibernation now. Interesting, the native folks are allowed to, to shoot bears here. But I guess, you know, they're island. And uh, it seems like they've got a pretty good bit of uh, control of the island, from what I understand. And the folks I've talked to, at least, are totally happy with that arrangement. And uh, can understand the anger towards outsiders, uh, though no one wants to be on the receiving end. But, uh, yeah, lands that are so sacred that you're not allowed to fight, you're not allowed to kill. Most of them are not allowed to kill animals even, but uh, when you go this far north, it's do that or die of starvation. And luckily, some of these streams that run into the rivers, not this... And yeah, back this way actually. Uh, on a good day, when it's complete uh, salmon mayhem, you can go out there and grab it with your hands and pull it to shore. There are that many. You can just net one up. In fact, it's so easy the game wardens really keep an eye out. Most of the jobs on this island actually are conservation jobs, which I am totally happy with hearing. And then um, with the lumber though, the way they're trying to get around the lumber limitations is they're making private, they're buying uh, as private citizens and then cutting down, clear cutting everything. And uh, I guess what they make on timber, I've seen massive floats of logs on the outside of the island being loaded into massive Chinese uh, freighters. And that ain't cool. Bayules. Places where you are not allowed to take more than what it you need to survive. Bayul is a Tibetan Buddhist concept. Padmasambhava, uh, one of the the greatest of the Buddha uh, Buddhist prophets, or however you say it, uh, come from a Pentecostal tradition, Pentagramacostal, and. Uh, but the Tibet, Padmasambhava said the Lord led him to set up lands of refuge throughout the Himalayas in places hard to reach. But there, when, once they get there, they will receive messages. And he actually had these lands with messages in these temples he had built himself with his consort, lovely consort, Yeshi Sogul. And to this day, they are still discovering some of them out in the hollers of the Himalayas. And, uh, bales. We definitely need to enforce keeping our, uh, our lands bales. I will refer you happily to my, uh, Gonzo audio book for the Monkey Rich Gang if you want ideas on how to further that sort of, a collective security arrangement. Goodbye, Doris. I love you. Did I tell you Doris is my mother's name?
Au revoir, Doris! Socialism is the worst thing that could happen to America. We're the ones benefiting from socialized natural resources that they just assume turn into products and toilet paper. Commodify. Filthy lucre.